Okay, we'll go into the class on the, the uh, treatise on white magic. We're on rule six. And um, the rule six is uh, about the opening of the third eye. The divas of the lower four feel the force when the eye opens and they are driven forth when they lose their master. Now, <clears throat> we were talking last time about how when the third eye opens, it, uh, <clears throat> it, it uh, helps to purify the body and it chases, it kind of uh, creates a force that drives away the lower vibrations that's affecting you <clears throat> and all your components drives those lower vibrations forth. So the <clears throat> lower lives are driven out and, and more refined lives enter into your, uh, your makeup. <clears throat> and remember your makeup just isn't your physical body. Your makeup is composed of your etheric body and your um, uh, astral or emotional body and your mental body and also what affects it all is the quality of prana that you take into your etheric body that is also refined. So when your third eye is open, it helps to uh, uh, purify your whole being by driving out the lower vibes and bringing in new vibes and new energy and new, uh, more refined lower lives to that make up the components of your being because you aren't just one life. <laughs> You're a composite of many lives. Anybody know how many cells are in a typical human body? <clears throat> many, many millions. Yeah, take a guess somebody. Is it billions or trillions or how much? Just take a guess. Billions. Thirty thirty trillion. How'd you know that? <laughs> I counted it. <laughs> he just finished counting them, huh? That's right, Curtis. Thirty trillion. About thirty oh, trillion God. cells. Thirty trillion cells. That's a lot of cells. And each one of these little cells is a life, living on its own and cooperating with all the other cells in your body. I'm really impressed you knew that, Curtis. Didn't well, think anyone would come really close. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I watch the science channel. Okay. And each cell has its own DNA, it has its own code, it has its own messenger, its own assignment, and its own cooperative effort to join with all the other cells. Yeah, they got their communication system, all kinds of machinery running in there and <clears throat> all kinds of things going on in this uh, little tiny cell. You know how many atoms is in a cell? <laughs> Probably about the same. <laughs> a lot. Similar amount. I, I believe it's about 60 trillion. I think it's even more if I remember right. Yeah. But it's <clears throat> it's as, as big or bigger number. <clears throat> so it's amazing the numbers that we're dealing with. Okay, so uh, the next step for the disciple is to learn to see the light in all forms and to open the thir third eye, the, uh, the soul accomplishes three activities. First of all, the third eye is an eye of vision in the fact that it allows the seeker to see divinity in all forms. Just as a physical eye registers forms, so does a spiritual eye register elimination within those forms, which elimination indicates a specific state of being. We talked a little about that last week that uh, we, <clears throat> some people can see auras in the human body and the etheric body in the human body. And we give an exercise on that last week, but also any form, you look around your room, every form in your room has etheric double. It's not quite as uh, uh, pronounced as a human etheric double, but they, uh, all forms have an etheric double. Okay, the second thing, the third eye 
called the Ajna Center, right in the center of the forehead, is a controlling factor of the magical work. Will is manifest through both the physical eye and the third eye. So how does this work? How is will manifested through the eye? Have you ever heard about hematis, for instance, hematizing by saying, look into my eyes? I've never used that method myself, but some hematists do because um, there is a power in the eye. If you have a pet dog, for instance, have you noticed that if you really look at it in the eye and give it a command, it really pays attention? Anybody here have a dog? You know, my dog just died. <laughs> yeah, you've uh, always, uh, you generally had a dog, but they, they pay extra attention when you look at them, don't they, Curtis? Yeah, yeah they're really connected to you their... You should have looked them in the eye more, Curtis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the eye, I think, projects an image, and that's what does the work. That, that leads to the creation of form. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the eyes are the window of the soul, which, which uh, kind of um, is intensified when you open your third eye of Shiva and you activate your pineal gland and you begin to almost radiate a new energy through that center. You don't really look through your eyes, you look kind of through your third eye. So it's kind of a triangular arrangement which intensifies really, really powerfully, which maybe your dog picks up on or other people. Right, and when you want to uh, uh, focus the will, we can do it through our third eye by focusing that, and it can also be used in healing work. You can uh, see, for instance, a radiant light coming out of your third eye and going to the other person focusing on the center that's closest to where he or she is having the problem and that will actually stimulate that center so you have to visualize uh, light coming out of your third eye and it can, can create a, a uh, an extension of the will okay uh, I, I kind of had a an explanation explained to me that uh, as you see through the two, two eyes, uh, you see where light stops. Uh, but when you see through a jenna, through the third eye, you see past the illusion of where actual light stops. Uh, you see with the third eye, so you see through uh, the foundations of illusionary uh, yeah. things. Okay. Okay. He says this, a soul knows the plan and when the alignment is right and the attitude correct, the will aspect of the divine man can function and bring about results. So that's one of the keys of power for the third eye is to align your vision with the vision of higher will. Tune in to what that higher will is in connection to your life and connection to uh, your group in connection to the planet itself. The more you are in alignment, the more power will be manifest through your third eye. Third, he says, it has a destructive aspect and the energy flowing through the third eye can have a disintegrating and destroying effect. It can, through its focused attention, directed by intelligent will, drive out physical matter. It is an agent of the soul in the purificatory work. It should be noted here that each of the subtle bodies in the three worlds are as a corresponding point of focus. And the center between the eyebrows is the physical counterpart. But we also have a counterpart in our emotional body and our mental body. He doesn't say where that is. He says it's a little bit different location. So we have a third eye, not only in our physical etheric, but in our emotional self and in our physical self. And um, um, that uh, using the, this power of the third eye 
we harmonize them all by when we get control of our astral nature, our emotional self, and then our mental self, and align them all, it increases the power of the third eye, and we use its destructive power, but the destructive power is used in a positive way because it's used to destroy or to drive out undesirable uh, thoughts, emotions, and matter that's affecting our our uh, lives in a negative way. So this is one important advantage of those that uh, are opening the, the third eye. He says, through these uh, three points where the third eye manifests in the physical, metal, mental, and astral, the soul looks upon these three worlds. So the soul can actually tune in to you and know what you're feeling, know what you're thinking, and know what you're seeing physically. But when you open your third eye, it brings you and your soul together. So uh, I guess I would take it before that time. It uh, just does its own thing in the world of souls. But when you begin to awaken, then it can come down and participate more with you. So you and your soul can become more one. So you can kind of see your soul maybe up in the higher realm. <laughs> and when you're in harmony with it, uh, it can see what's going on in your life. So um, I guess you'll never have complete privacy. But since you're an extension of your soul, it's uh, your it's it's. It's uh, just yourself you're dealing with. Hey, Joe, I was going to say, Yeah. you talked a little bit earlier about the being the observer yeah. uh, or the actor. You know, the world is a stage. And the other, the higher part is to become the director where you see your soul directing your life and you see that all the events that happen in your life happen for a reason that your soul is actually your director. And if you connect with that, then you can raise yourself, your, your energy to a higher place and actually totally understand exactly why everything is happening to you, whether it's good or bad, your trials, tribulations. And then you can under, come to a greater understanding um, from the position of the director. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Another way to kind of visualize that is uh, your, com your computer kind of corresponds to your brain. The software kind of corresponds to how your brain and mind works, but uh, you, the user, corresponds to kind of your soul operating in you directing things. Yeah. And uh, so that's a good way to look at it there, Curtis. Thanks. This this brings to mind uh, stuff I had read about these uh, this an, uh, master animal trainer that he worked in like Hollywood movies and stuff and this guy could even make a fly do whatever he wanted it to do. A and, fly? Uh, wow. Yeah, he could even make a fly like take off when he wanted it to and land where he wanted it to. And when he was asked how he does it, he says basically in his mind's eye he sees himself looking out of that critter's eyes and uh, following the path that he's setting for it. And the, they just do it. <laughs> really? Well, yeah. that'd be, that'd be, man. Where, where'd you hear about this guy? Uh, it's some book many years ago uh, had to do mind over matter or something. And uh, this, this guy, he was doing and telepathically controlling animals. And that's the way he said he did it. He said, he looks through their eyes and makes them perform as if, you know, uh, <laughs> they were just following uh, yeah. their own idea. But it, he was implanting that idea in their little brains. You know, an animal that's hard to control is a cat, but I would think a fly would be even harder than a cat. I so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to know how to work. <laughs> I want to know how to work that magic on my wife. <laughs> I've actually I've actually tried it on some animals before and you really it really does work. So. <laughs> Interesting. I'd like to see you get her to fly, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> just just don't tell your wife you're experimenting with that, Curtis. You might get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. Okay, it's uh, this third work, the destructive work of the soul, he says, is touched upon uh, in the destructive work of getting rid of old forms, shaking out the body's matter, the an undesirable nature, breaking down barriers and limitations. Um, what... Uh, what, what what kinds of things do you think the a lot of us need to be use the power of the third eye to break down as far as barriers barriers between us and the soul what are uh, what do we need to uh, eliminate and and dissolve you mean things like glamour and uh things of that yeah. sort or yeah i'll just give or, one like uh hurt feelings for instance uh, grievances they need to be yeah. broken down yeah and uh All the things that are negative or unhealthy for the growth wrong methods of thinking illusions glamours we have all kinds of problems that we need broken down uh mindsets thought forms a lot of us have thought forms that uh, um, we uh, that keep us from progressing because according to a thought form, our beliefs are supposed to be such and such. Somebody may come along with something that runs contrary to our beliefs and we automatically reject it, but maybe it's true. Maybe that thought form or that belief structure that we had in our mind needs to be shattered. Okay. These three activities, he says, corresponds to the three aspects. Seeing the light in all things, he says, corresponds to the third aspect. Control through the eye corresponds to the second aspect. In the most mysterious sense, the soul is the eye of the monad, enabling the monad, which is pure being, to work, to contact, to know, and to see. So that's interesting as uh, you are the eye, uh, the, you uh, and your soul, when your third eye opens, your soul will use the third eye to, to contact you and see through your world. Yet the monad, which is the higher self of the soul, is doing the same thing with the soul. So if everything's in harmony, if, this, if the monad is looking through the eyes of the soul and the soul is looking through your eyes, then that would mean that uh, the highest link to God is linked to you. And that would be the final goal for all of us. This happened to Christ when he said, I and my father are one. And uh, uh, DK tells us that... Uh, the father there, he, his, his father in heaven was his personal monad um, when, he, when he said those words anyway. And then uh, the destruction is a first ray. First ray governs that. And the last analysis, it is the monad that brings about the final abstraction, destroys all forms, withdraws itself from manifestation, and ends the cycle of creative work. So we are connected to the soul. The soul is connected to the monad, and we're all projections from that point uh, that is connected to God. And uh, we go through all this experience as a soul and then as a personality, and then we unite with the soul. The soul unites with the monad. The monad unites with God, and, and we go back to... Uh, uh, we eventually go back to the original oneness. The third eye opens as a result of conscious development, right alignment, and inflow of soul life. Then its magnetic controlling force makes itself felt, controlling the lives of the lower bodies, driving forth the lower four elements, earth, water, fire, and air, and forcing the lunar lords to abdicate. The personality, which hitherto has been the master, no longer can control, and the soul become, comes into full domination in the three worlds. So that's the goal. 
because uh, for us to become one with the soul <clears throat> and a, a strong key for that is um, um, to um, become, is opening up the third eye. Now the lower elemental lives that control the physical body are driven forth, he says, and higher lives replace them. So we have this, the third eye drives forth uh, lower elementals from the physical body and we get a more refined physical body. Why is this important? It's important because um, as you open up all the centers of your body and as you evolve and as you uh, 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 open up the petals of these higher centers, you have higher forces coming in. And to handle the higher forces, you have to have driven forth many of the lower elementals out of your, uh, your lower bodies. And then you'll be able to handle the higher forces. Many people, when they have, uh, if they prematurely have centers open, they will get ill. If, even if it's not prematurely, they'll feel a disturbance and take them a while to adjust. They may go through a period of uh, uh, just feeling kind of strange or weird or having ill health for a period of time until they adjust. So this is why it's important for the, uh, and the opening of the third eye is very important. It helps to drive forth the lower elements to be replaced by uh, higher ones of higher vibration. Then he talks about the astral. A similar thing happens in the astral body, which brings an end to restlessness and fluidic tempestuousness, which have hitherto characterized it. This is a big one. The astral body is, <clears throat> the emotional body is the most difficult uh, and time consuming to control because uh, you can control the physical body often just by making a decision, well, I'm going to change my diet or I'm going to change my way of living or whatever. But the astral body, sometimes just making a decision doesn't really do the trick. It takes a lot of effort to get it under control so you can have it um, <clears throat> in a peaceful state no matter what's going on around you. So when Curtis drops an anvil on his foot, he can... Uh, just uh, not not remain. He can remain calm next time once he gets that astral body. <laughs> I know I dropped an anvil on my foot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ultimate test, I think. <laughs> I heard one of them. <laughs> and on the mental plane, he says, old forms disappear before the clear light that uh, manifests the person, replaces the uh, old with the new. The old commentary makes a, a comment on this. I got to tell a story on Curtis on the old commentary. I, Tibetan often quotes the old commentary. And Curtis, when he started reading uh, the writings, Alice A. Bailey kept coming across this old commentary. And he's really impressed by how, uh, by how wise it was. So he uh, wrote, loses trust and says, uh, how much is a copy of the old commentary? <laughs> 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 and they got a laugh out of that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they wrote him back and said, uh, well, no, that's in the master's archives and nobody has a copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, you, you didn't know that they sent me one? <laughs> no, I didn't. I yeah. haven't heard that. So anyway, he quotes old commentary here, and it says, One glance the soul doth cast upon the forms of mind. A ray of light streams out and darkness disappears. Distortions and evil forms fade out, and all the little fires die out. The lesser lights are no more seen. The eye, through light, awakens to life the needed modes of being. To the disciple, this will carry knowledge. To the ignorance, no sense is seen for a sense lacks. Okay. So I always like to read and contemplate those words. It's quite profound. 
Okay, any comments or questions before we move ahead here? Yeah, when I was uh, doing life coaching in LA and people would come in and they had all these preconceived ideas or attachments to being right or uh, their belief system is better than the next person. Uh, my, my advice was always enter into a state of not know. Just, just don't know. You don't know. You, you think you know, but what you think you know is probably not correct anyway. So you might as well just assume a, a, a posture of, I don't know. And that opens the door, a channel to receive things that you will know that will fill that void. Just like the greater lives fill the void of the lesser lives when they leave. So does greater knowledge fill when you say, I don't know. And you create that vessel. And in that vessel comes greater truth. So just be, be in a state of, I don't know, don't know. Hey, you know, that's one thing that impressed me about Jordan Peterson. We've been talking about him on the keys a little bit, and uh, several people have been watching his videos, and he's a very intelligent guy. And and, uh, uh, and it, when he argues with people, uh, he just uh, confounds them. And a lot of the times, <clears throat> when they get to a certain point, he'll just says, we don't know that, you know. And the... Uh, interviewer asking in question acts like the inter the interviewer acts like well we know all these things you know <laughs> <laughs> but he points out one of the things that kind of i find an, enjoyable about watching him is he keeps telling the uh, person trying to attack him he says well we don't know this yeah. and uh the guy doesn't really have a good comeback to that because he did the interviewer or the other guy didn't know he didn't know until <laughs> uh, Jordan told him that we don't know. He didn't, call, he didn't, really, it didn't really occur to him that we don't know this, you know. I call that the Columbo effect. Yeah. You know, they're like on the, on the, the detective Columbo. And he'd yeah. go, well, gee, I just don't know about this kind of stuff. And then the world just jumps in to provide all the answers he's looking for. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's got me with him. He he get just ready to leave, and then he'd say, "Oh, one more one question." One more thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you you put yourself in the spot of the guy being investigated, and makes you pretty feel pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you were gone already. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> He says here, the elemental of air symbolically understood is a substratum of energy which works through the forms in the etheric body, which is dealt with through the breath and handled through the science of pranayama. Pranayama is a science of breath. The elemental form is the intricate etheric structure, the nadis and the centers, and all advanced students know <clears throat> now these are controlled by the focus attention of the soul and contemplation acting through the head center focused in the re region of the third eye and swept into right and specific activity by an act of the will in the above sentence i have concentrated the formula for all magic work on the physical plane it is through the etheric body and the force directed through one or the other centers that the soul carries on the work of magic. It is through the intense focusing of the intuition intense. in the head and the turning of the attention through the third eye towards the center to be used that the force finds the correct outlet. That force is made potent by the energizing, directing, intelligent will. And this is really, if we understood these first uh, six rules, we could uh, uh, have control over our lives to the point that uh, the disciple would have good health, uh, be a good, in a good emotional state, wouldn't get depressed, uh, be in a good mental state where he would be able to think logically and reasonably and uh, to the point that where he, when he meets others, 
of like evolution, he would, uh, uh, um, they would be able to be in harmony and harmony and agreement with each other. Okay, that's the end of rule six. Uh, any questions on that? Everybody uh, got it all figured out how to get their lives under control? Well, I, I got an idea the other day. I was contemplating all this stuff and uh, op opening my mind to new ideas. And um, on the concept of triad technology, uh i have my wife's niece staying with us so we have an automatic triad here which works out really well her name's teresa she does the cooking cleaning my wife does the gardening um i make the money and <laughs> it works it's, it's a very harmonic situation i have to give it i have to share it around a little bit which i don't like uh i love doing that but but the harmony between the three of us is really eye-opening and it's interesting this she's been here for about six weeks now and we've had no friction everything has just run smooth we communicate in the morning over coffee what we're gonna have for dinner how everything is working and I thought well you know what this uh, why don't you just see yourself in triads wherever you go so now, when I'm around people, I try to create, uh, or I do create, little groups of three. So I bring, if I'm talking to someone, I'll bring in a third party and just have that stimulating uh, triad effect just, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis with different people. So you just have this consciousness of, you know, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to be a uh, link in a triad and create little triangles wherever I go. And I've been playing with that and it's pretty interesting the result that you get when you open your mind to that idea. Yeah, DK says the beginning of life is triangles. And so <clears throat> uh, when we look through a electron microscope, we see many uh, cells and particles joining the, together in a triangle uh, relationship. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, well, I hope that continues to work for you, Curtis. Of course, yeah. not all triangles work, but you do need to have a little bit of similarity of vibration there. And apparently you got it going. So that's, that if you got one that's working and the energy is flowing, it can be a great, great thing to have. Yeah. We'll just start uh, rule seven, and um, just got to. We'll just go under that for a few minutes. Rule seven reads thus: The dual forces on the plane whereon the vital power must be sought are seen. Two paths face the solar angel. The poles vibrate. A choice confronts the one who meditates. Well, there's always two paths and there's always a choice and we encounter a lot of them, but it says the soul encounters a choice. So that's interesting. And he begins this uh, lesson by talking about the battleground on the astral plane. He says, we've contemplated the first six rules, which deals specifically with the mental plane. Hence, they have a practical value for those who are beginning to utilize the power of mind and magical work of creation. Now, it's interesting. He, uh, he makes this following statement about how uh, the earth is, about how we have progressed. Um, And I find this kind of interesting. He talks about how uh, people, you know, the goal of humanity is to make us more mental, to overcome our dependence on being controlled by emotions and, and to become a little bit more mental. And he says that's interesting. And, but uh, listen to this. This was written in 1934. It sounds like he could have 
could have made this observation about our world today. Okay, here's what he says. It's interesting to note that in this connection, that as humanity enters into the heritage of mind, there appears simultaneously a growing tendency toward the magical work. Schools of affirmation are cropping up on all sides, whose announced intent is to create those natural conditions wherein a man may have what he deems to be admirable and advisable. Books on the subject of the creative mind are flooding the markets, and discussion on the force back of the creative arts are deemed of vital interest. Boy. Don't we see that around us a lot today? I didn't realize it was really a permeating society back in 1934, but uh, in, in our time, we have all kinds of books telling us how to magically uh, materialize what we want. Can you think of some books that are uh, in that direction? Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, that was uh, one that was popular way back in uh, the Tibetans' day. Uh, and that was the one that kind of was a breakthrough book about using our, our uh, uh, higher sources to materialize what we desire. What are books today that are out in uh, that direction? Psycho-Cybernetics. Psycho yeah, Psycho-Cybernetics. That was one in the 70s. That was a big one. Uh, do you remember the principle behind that, Rick? Uh, basically, uh, whatever you imagined uh, uh, experiencing was actual experience. If you wanted to practice and get good at golf, you could do it sitting in an easy chair, just imagining it. Yeah, and this, uh, the guy was a plastic surgeon, if I remember right, and he found that when he corrected a person's face, it changed their personality. So it didn't really change the, them, but it changed it changed the way they saw themselves. And so he, this made him start thinking about by changing maybe the way we see ourselves, we can change ourselves. And so uh, that inspired me. Uh, Maxwell Maltz. Yeah, right, right. Okay, what's some that's uh, around today that you can think of? Shakti Gwain, Creative Visualization. Yeah, creative visualization. That's uh, another another one that was out some time ago. One that's really popular has been popular the past few years has been the secret. Has anyone heard of that one? It was a really big seller, the secret. And what was the, what was was the name of it? The the secret. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it was basically it's, 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 think and grow rich repackaged. <laughs> Yeah. It was uh, basically the principles in there stated in a different type of language. And uh, another one is The Power of Intention by Wayne Dyer. Anybody heard of that book? Heard of it. Another one that was a big Dyer. seller was The Law of Attraction by Abraham. That's a channel book, but it was a really big seller. And it was the idea that you just got to put yourself in the right state of mind and you draw stuff, will draw what you want to you. Uh, the Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle was about consciousness creating reality somewhat. The Four Agreements and the Power of Eight by Lynn McTaggart is another one. And so we have uh, quite a few books that are... Uh, uh, kind of uh, in an elementary form uh, using some of the principles of white magic. But they're all centered on kind of selfishness. This is how to get what you want. They aren't centered on this is how to be a servant for humanity. So he says the, the key for white magic, if it's pure white, is that uh, you use the powers to serve humanity but the principles involved can also manifest uh, your personal desires in your life, um, whether it be health, wealth, or, or whatever. He says the first 15 rules are divided into three categories. The first six are rules for the mental plane. 
and we just finished the first six. Then the next five are rules controlling the astral body. And then the last, that's the middle five. And then the last four will be rules that govern manifestation on the actual physical plane. The use of energy is either manipulated by the soul and is subject to the natural flows in the three worlds. Either the person is the victim or the controller. So the, these principles of white magic, if the disciple absorbs them, he then becomes the person in control. If he is not using these rules, then he will be controlled by outside elements. His emotions will not be under his control. His thoughts will not be under control. His body won't be under his control and will, will uh, suffer all kinds of problems. But when the principles are assumed by the disciple, then he can put his entire personality under his control. Okay, and recapping the first six rules. Rule one, he says, um, the solar angel collects himself, scatters not his force, but meditation deep communicates with his reflection. He says, rule one is recollection resulting in concentration. Rule two is response resulting in an interaction between the higher and the lower. Rule three, radiation resulting in a sounding forth. Rule four, respiration resulting in creative work. Rule five, reunion resulting in atonement at one minute. Rule six, reorientation resulting in a clear vision of the plan. Okay, that said, we'll move on to rule seven next week. Um, any comments or questions before we move ahead here? Yeah, he uh, has some pretty heavy-duty stuff going on there. <clears throat> uh, I've got a suggestion, uh, JJ. Yeah. It appears that uh, it appears that Christine could probably really use a shot of our energy if you could lead us into a meditation to send it to her. Maybe Joshua too. It looks like is he's that out. the Christine from 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 Iceland? Uh, well, the new one that you said just came aboard. Yeah. She's on the line. Looks like she's sleeping. Maybe she needs a shot of energy. If you can oh, lead yeah. us into meditation. Uh, okay. I'm, not, I'm not sleeping. I am listening. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, we'll um, we'll visualize us all in a circle and give us all a shot. How's that sound? But meanwhile, we're going to start with a great invocation, and I don't know how many were aware I posted it that uh, today was the day of the full moon. Does anyone know why it is that uh, the masters advise us to meditate during the full moon, that communication with the, the higher lives is easier during that time period? Does anyone know why that's the case? Well, it seems like the energies are heightened by the the energy of the moon. I don't know. Okay, to, to figure it out, look at the law of correspondences. We have day and night. In the daytime, look at the difference between day and night. If we have a sunny day and then a dark night with no moon, it's really dark outside. You know, all you see is a handful of stars. And then the moon comes and it begins to reveal its light as it uh, goes through its phrases. And then when the full moon approaches, the light in the sky is magnified a significant amount over just the stars being visible. In other words, during the full moon, you have during the dark night of the soul, so to speak, the greatest possible light that is available for the disciple to see. 
So see the time of when the sun is shining, the time when you're one with your soul between lives. And then we come to this earth life, it's like night. And then uh, we see just a, a few stars in the sky. And then when the moon reaches its height, it, it reflects uh, a good portion of the light of the sun so we can definitely see there's light there. And so <clears throat> the fact that uh, during the nighttime, the greatest light appears during the full moon uh, is a symbol, and that, that symbol translates into the reality that makes it easier to contact higher lives during that time period. We know the full moon has an effect because <clears throat> all kinds of weird uh, things have people do strange things. All most many police departments report that they. Uh, keep an extra eye out during the full moon because it has a, a strange effect on people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll the go ahead and say the great invocation since uh, the full moon happened at 5.56 this morning, uh, uh, mountain daylight time. And so we aren't too far off. <clears throat> and so the, uh, the moon is still pretty bright out there if you look out your window if it's there. We sound the Om. Om. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Now we'll sound the Om as we sound it. Lift your consciousness up to the third eye, to the center in the head. See a light and visualize within that light the consciousness of Christ and the Masters. Om, 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 om. Now, since um, I mentioned that uh, some people might need a charge of energy, we'll just do the Song of Eternal Life. And I'd advise everyone to uh, print up these four mantras that we use uh, now and then so you have them available, so you can have the words available as we go through them. If, if you don't have them available now, just follow along with me as I say them. Okay, this is a song of eternal life. Visualize us first of all, all in a circle, all of us together. Visualize there be 24 in the circle. There's not 24 of us here, but uh, there's far more than that available in the uh, 
uh, kingdom of the soul. So visualize 24 people with us all being there, other people joining in to fill, male, female, 12 males and 12 females, all linked in a circle. And visualize energy going from left to right as we say the song. And as it's going from left to right, feel it going through you and giving you strength and energy. We thank you, Father, Mother, Spirit, for the energy of life which streams from universal source to us, for the life that circulates through each atom and cell, permeating our entire bodies and minds, bringing health and vitality to all of our living parts. We bask in this life. We feel the life. We are the life. The life which knows not corruption. The life which makes all things new. The life which always is. We feel the life from our toes to the top of our heads and give thanks for its abundance. We praise and love our bodies and all their parts for receiving this life and spirit and source. We praise body, mind, soul, and spirit for receiving without ceasing. This time we'll finish with the Om. Om. Visualize the energy now in circulation and visualize this for about a minute. Okay, any comments or questions before we dismiss? Good to see everybody here. Appreciate you guys showing up. We'll have these uh, available uh, for you to look at later on. Okay, light and love, everyone. Thank you, JJ. Good night. Thank you, JJ. Good night, everybody. Thank you, JJ. Uh, sleep tight, everybody. And to sleep. <laughs> oh, it's four. <laughs>